A Beacon in the Dark by Noha Ijiachi. Chapter 22. Burned Bridges Rebuilt. They walked in silence. Too much on their shoulders, too many thoughts in their heads, too many doubts in front of them. A puzzle with so many pieces, and yet not enough pieces at all. No one spoke as they made their way to the nearest police station. No one said a thing when the agents reacted with shock at seeing this group of kids come in, and with them, the UA student that had ended up all over the news after being kidnapped. Bakugo got whisked away as the police agents made all the calls that needed to be made. They go whisked somewhere else, asked to sit in a little waiting room until someone responsible for them could come pick them up. No one spoke. No one dared to say anything, to pronounce those words, to ask those questions, to imply anything at all. They sat in silence. Aizawa took a peek into the room, releasing a deep sigh. Apparently, now Kirishima and Yaoi Rosa, too, were part of the goddamn squad. Just perfect. When he entered, five pairs of eyes looked up to him, five similar expressions of guilt rising to their faces. Only Midoriya didn't bother, just barely turned, his expression unreadable, blood that had been badly wiped away, drying and cracking under his nose and chin. He was pale, dark smudges under his eyes. He probably felt like crap. Kind of deserved it if you asked Aizawa. This kid is the worst possible influence on the face of the planet I swear. There's a car waiting outside for you. We are getting all of you back to your houses. Aizawa says, loosening a bit the tie he was still wearing after the press conference. We will have warns. But for now, the top priority is to get your safe and sound to your parents. Sir, Kirishima says, raising his hand as if they are in class. Technically speaking, we didn't fight, so... Now your rose your face palms. The worst influence. Technically speaking, you are not in trouble legally, yes. Aizawa replies curtly. That doesn't mean we won't have words at the proper moment. Now get your behind out there before I lose my patience. Kirishima doesn't seem to be particularly afraid by his words. He almost looks cheerful, a little brat. Nor does Todoroki, while Yaoyorozu, Ida, and Ibaraka definitely show at least some signs of shame. Maybe there's still hope. Maybe he could at least save them from the Mandoria's terrible influence affliction. Mandoria silently follows, expression still blank and unreadable. Aizawa stops him with a hand on the shoulder. Not you. He says, you are coming with me. The kid didn't seem to have anything to say. He just sat in Aizawa's car, silent. He definitely was there, lucid and conscious. Did not show any sign he might have been out of his damn mind, as he had been far too often in the recent past. He was just... silent. The reason why wasn't so hard to understand, obviously. Aizawa had about 1,000 things and then some to say to him, but the idea of doing it now felt needlessly cruel. His expression had shifted. There was a sort of tired acceptance in the boy's eyes now, like he knew already that this was the end of an era. That All Might was no more. And knowing him, he probably realized that long before anyone even had the chance to do so. They still did not talk once they got to the hospital, off the car, up some stairs, down the corridor, and finally in the room. When they entered, Suko Uchi and Gran Torino turned with equally surprised expressions, and Toshinori, pale, bandaged, tired, blinked, sitting on his bed. Medoria hesitated. The air was full of unspoken words and the lull of regrets, and his scarred, misshapen hand lingered on the door jam. Then he seemed to steal himself, still not a word coming out of his mouth, and he advanced. He walked right between Gran Torino and Tsukuchi, head held high, unseeing eyes pointed forward. 
With no hesitation, he climbed on Toshinori's bed on his knees, circling Toshinori's neck with his arms in a tight hug. Toshinori blinked, something unreadable in his eyes, and then he closed them with a trembly sigh, his own arms gently cradling the boy. Tsukuji smiled a bit as he stood from the chair he was sitting on, Gran Torino shaking his head with exasperation despite a small smile of his own on his lips, and they both silently walked away, following Aizawa out the door. There would be time for words and questions and trying to cram some common sense into the unbelievably stubborn head. But for now, Aizawa could let them have a moment. Toshinori keeps his eyes closed, silent, just enjoying the warmth of young Midoriya's breathing against his shoulder, just enjoying the feeling of having him close in his arms. Warm, safe, alive. The boy had given him one too many scares lately. One too many times he had been truly afraid of losing him in all possible ways. They stayed like that for a long time, young Midoriya's girly air tickling against Toshinori's hollow cheek as he rested his head against the boys. Midoriya is the one to break the silence. I can't feel it anymore, he murmured softly. It really is gone, isn't it? I'm afraid it is, yes. Toshinori replies, voice just as soft. Slowly, young Midoriya releases him, shifting to sit on the edge of the bed, facing him. There's so much written in his tired eyes. Too much, maybe. He's still the doe-eyed kid with round features that make him appear younger than he is, and yet something in his expression makes him seem more... adult. Forced to grow up too fast. It didn't feel like it was painful this time. He says, it just, it was there, and then it was not. Turning his face down a bit, he seems to be looking at his own hand before putting it on his chest. I can't feel the chimes anymore, too. I do wonder if that is for the better. I think having to constantly look into someone's soul, whether you want it or not, is probably not a good thing. Toshinori muses slowly. The boy replies with a non-committal hum, turning his face back up to him. You and I, we are very similar in many ways, I think. Toshinori continues gently. We care a lot, but we are not very good at expressing our feelings, aren't we? That finally put a frail, small, and tired smile on young Midoriya's face. Yes, I think that's a fair evaluation, he whispers back. We've both said things and performed actions that ended up hurting each other, even if that was not the intention we had. Toshinori takes the boy's right hand, examining the crisscross of scars on it. And now that my power is gone, now that I'm not All Might anymore but just Toshinori Yagi, I would like to have a fresh start with you. Young Midoriya blinks his fingers tightening a bit around Toshinori's hand. What do you mean? I mean that if you'll allow me, I would be happy to still follow you in your growth. Teach you what I can, and also be a confidant, someone you could trust. Toshinori replies, not taking his eyes away from young Midoriya's pale ones for how pointless the gesture was. I would like to still be there for you. A trusted figure, a friend. Someone you could speak with freely, with no fear of shame or judgment. There's a moment of silence as the boy seems to be weighing Toshinori's words in his mind. It might not be easy for either of us, Toshinori adds in a low voice. But we can learn together. You've taught me as much as I've taught you, and I do not wish for us to accidentally hurt each other anymore. A clean slate, the boy murmurs. Is it fair, though? I, I've not been... He seems to be struggling with words at tense expression on his face. I've done things I should have not, and said just as many. I don't think I should get to walk away from it unpunished. 
The fact that you are saying this for me, it's proof enough that you understand what you've done wrong. Toshinori replies, putting a gentle hand on the boy's head. And so do I. I also think the pain we've caused in one another is enough punishment, don't you? That's when the tears finally rise to the boy's eyes. Toshinori's actually surprised it took so long. He was wrong, the boy murmurs, closing his eyes, tears rolling down his cheeks as he hangs his head lower. I knew he was wrong, and yet he managed to plant a seed of doubt in my head. Toshinori blinks, perplexed. Who was? Oh, for one. Young Midoriya looks back up, a fresh couple of tears falling down the wet tracks on his face. He told me you didn't trust me. I'm sorry, I believed that, even if only for a second. He is very good with his words, Toshinori concedes. Do not be so hard on yourself. He managed to get the best of me in the past. He still does to this day. The boy sniffs, drying his tears away with a hand, releasing a trembly sigh. Could you tell me how you managed to speak with him anyway? Toshinori finally asks because he has so many questions. And the boy himself ended up touching upon the topic after all. When I... When I was searching for Kacha on the other night, I accidentally stumbled into him. Midoriya says, voice low, nervously picking at the covers on Toshinori's bed. We sort of connected. We spoke for a bit. Actually, mostly him. He knew who I was, and I was so confused. I kept forgetting things. Couldn't even remember you. It was very strange. Toshinori has to resist the urge to curse, rage bubbling up his throat. Who knew what sort of sweet lies his mortal foe had been whispering in this poor boy's ear? I remembered all of it when I woke up, and I realized who he was. Midoriya continues shaking his head. Earlier today, during the battle, I didn't mean to connect to him, too. It just sort of snapped into place. I see. Tashinori says, still mostly confused, but not asking for clarification. This boy's inner world was something he probably would never be able to understand. Still, that had been quite amusing in a sense. When young Midoriya blinks, confused, Toshinori can't help the little jackal coming out of his mouth. Go fuck yourself. That was truly funny in retrospect. The boy sniggers and makes a face as if he had even surprised himself by doing so. I'm not very good at winning comebacks, I'm afraid. He says, tilting his head on his side, dragging a hand on his cheek. That was the best I had at the moment. Toshinori takes a deep breath as something in his chest releases. It's been too long since he last saw young Midoriya laugh and mean it. Thank you for your help. Even if you shouldn't use your quirk like that anymore. There's still a bit of blood drying under his nose. I know. I know why you and Aizawa sensei told me to stop. Midoriya sighs, tired. I know how dangerous it is for me now. I won't use it like that anymore. I promised this one would be the last one. Besides, I'm probably going to have a headache for the next 1,000 years after the little trick I pulled, so... Let's just... Stop with the self-sacrificing, at least for a bit, hmm? Toshinori says, gently ruffling his hair. I think Aizawa will go great early at this rate. I'll try, the boy replies, a small smile, leaving place to a guilty expression. I'm sorry I caused you both to worry so much. I'm sure he will have his peace to say to you, but for now let's not think about that. I think we both had a full difficult day, so I'd rather not linger on past mistakes and we live old pains, if that is okay with you. The boy nods, silent, before surprising him again by shifting closer and leaning against Toshinori's chest in another hug. Toshinori let himself relax, circling an arm around young Midoriya's shoulders, his weight firm and reassuring against him. But... I think... Midoriya says after a while, his voice low and tired. 
Even if you don't have one for all anymore, I... You're still All Might. You're still my hero. Nothing will ever change that. Thank you, my boy. Toshinori whispers, gently carting his fingers through the soft curls. Then he adds, chuckling, Now that everyone knows who I am, though, you will probably have just actually start to address me by name, you know. That is not happening. The boy replies, matter-of-factly, and angrily terrified at the prospect. Like, ever. Toshinori's chest hurts, but he does not stifle the laugh when it comes out from the very depths of it. Thank you so much for calling me, Mr. Aizawa. Inko Midoriya looks just about as done with everything ever as Aizawa feels. He'd almost feel bad for the boy if it wasn't for the fact that he really, really asked for it all. Izuku Midori was just about to get his bottom grounded until he at least reached the adult age, going by the look on her face. Oh well, that's what you get when you silently escape from your hospital room from the window to go butt your nose where you really should have not. Although the intervention of the new and extended Midoriya Protection Squad did manage to retrieve Bakugo without having to directly enter the fight, so that had to count for something. Maybe Aizawa will intercede for him, just a bit. Give him a week less of grounding. Maybe. He guides her through the corridors, muttering, I'm pretty sure the only places we are meeting are hospitals. Find it when he's hit by the unwanted familiarity of it all. She sighs. If I can avoid to set foot in another one for at least a year after this, it'll be all the better. He doesn't feel the need to add much else as they stop in front of Toshinori's room. Aizawa knocks, but when he receives no response, he cracks the door open, both he and Inko peering inside. Toshinori and Midoriya seem to be asleep. The boy lying on the side against Toshinori's chest, a protective arm on his shoulders. He looks so small compared to Tojinori's considerable height. Inko makes a surprised little sound as she slowly opens the door a little more, silently approaching the bed. Aizawa right behind her. They look so peaceful. Aizawa watches the woman as she stares and stares with a surprised expression. Before her eyes turn a little wet, a hand rising to her chest, a deep sigh shaking her frame. Aizawa looks down at the boy and how young he looks and how innocent he seems to be as he sleeps curled up against the man that had grown to be much more than just a symbol in his eyes, looking nothing but the little angry terror that had completely turned their lives upside down in the past few weeks. Kids lucky they make such a cute picture. Maybe he will only get grounded until he's 17 instead of 18. Inko follows quietly as they entered in a waiting room. Without asking, Aizawa approaches the vending machine in a corner and fishes a coin purse out of his suit slacks. The sound of the coins being inserted is almost deafening in the deep, heavy silence engulfing them, and after a minute, a hand holding a plastic glass enters Inko's field of vision. She accepts the coffee, silent, and Aizawa sits on the row of plastic chairs in front of her, sipping his own. What am I supposed to do? She asks, breaking the silence after what felt like an eternity. Aizawa does not respond, and she continues. My first thought was to go visit your principal straight away and pull Izuku out of school. She doesn't miss it, the tiniest flinch that shakes the man in front of her. His fingers tightened around the plastic, and he took a slow, methodical sip. I... I don't know how much of this I can take anymore. She coils a bit into herself, closing both hands on the warm beverage. Izuku, he... He's been through much for his entire life, and it only seems to be getting worse, and I... Despite how much I want to stop him, I don't know if I... Words seem to stumble under her tongue and she sighs, dragging a hand over her face. He's never been so happy, she whispers, even when I thought things would finally turn for him when he was still in middle school. Even then, he's never been as happy as he has been in these months. 
Izuku's smile emerges in her mind. The way he grinned and his unseeing eyes lit up as he spoke to her of his friends, of the lessons of all the amazing experiences he was having. Even when he was stuck on a hospital bed, pale and tired and just barely alive. Even then, his smile, whenever they spoke of his current life, of the people that he was growing to love so much, had been blinding. There's nothing that I want more than to stop him and protect him from further harm, and yet, I don't know if I have in me the strength of doing so, of ripping the happiness away from his hands, and I know... I know he will not stop, even if I do so, she says, her voice hitching and trembling as her eyes sting with tears. What am I supposed to do? The silence stretches as she slowly breathes in and out, tears pooling at the corner of her eyes, but never spilling. I owe you an apology, Aizawa murmurs, voice rough. I could not protect him. I failed him. And in doing so, I failed you as well. She looks up, meeting his dark, tired eyes. I found myself in front of a choice. He continues holding her gaze. I found myself having to choose between abandoning a child to certain death or sending another child to his aid, hoping the both of them would make it back safe and sound. And this... This is what we do all the time. We make choices other people can't. This is what a hero does. And yet, he hesitates, taking a deep breath. I tried to reason with myself that Midoriya is in my class for a reason. To become a hero. To one day take the burden of those choices onto himself. And I tried to reason that I made the right call. But at the end of the day, I broke the promise I made to you. And then I failed him a second time when I couldn't stop him from taking one more false step. When I spoke to him in a way that made him feel cornered. The silence falls once more. There's a deep, tired regret weighing into Aizawa's eyes. I've been teaching for years. He continues when she says nothing. I've been through many classes, and I I do not have children of my own and probably never will, but that never stopped me from trying to do my best with those that have been entrusted into my hands. Never stopped me from caring for them, from trying to give them the tools to do their best in life. And yet at times I fail, like I did with Midoriya. A pause. And for that, I am deeply sorry. I do not think there's a single way I will be able to earn your forgiveness. Ingo gulps around a knot in her throat, searching his eyes. He never looked away from her, not even once. And yet she saw the minute tremor of his fingers. I don't have an answer for you. Aizawa says, slowly standing. He carefully makes his way to the trash can near the vending machine and throwing his empty glass in. He stands there, only half turned to her, but still not leaving her eyes. I cannot tell you what the right thing to do is. He is your son, and at the end of the day, you have the last word. All I can say to you is this. If you are willing to give me a second chance despite my complete failure, I will do everything in my power to not let it happen a second time. His voice drops in volume, but it's steady, not a trace of doubt in it. He will not stand down, no matter what we say. So I will do everything I can to make sure he will be ready for what he will face in the future. When Izuku slowly wakes, he feels good in a way he hadn't felt ever since he almost kicked the bucket after his little encounter with Shigaraki. He's still sore, his back pain, it's still there, and it always will probably, but it's manageable, and he can push it away in the back of his mind. He's still a bit tired, but not in that way that made him feel as if he could fall asleep at any moment. His heart still feels frail, too many hits in so little time, 
But Izuku now knows that things will be okay. Difficult and painful, surely. But they will be okay. He carefully turns his quirk on. Just a bit. Barely a circle around him. His head feels heavy, but it doesn't hurt anymore. He dares expanding the scope some more, realizing he's alone in a hospital room he does not recognize. Oh, wait. He fell asleep in All Might's bed. He must still be there. No, well, that's just a tad embarrassing. Sighing, he slowly drags himself up to sit. He can hear the chirping of birds outside and the warmth of sunrise hitting part of his arm. He must have slept right through the night. He cannot recall having any nightmares. That's no, for sure. He carefully takes in more of what is surrounding him. There are various lights he does not recognize around, above and below, until he pinpoints a group of very familiar ones not far in the distance. Izuku silently slips off the bed, padding on his socked feet outside the room and down a corridor directed to the little group. He stops in front of the door when he hears Grant Arena's voice slightly muffled. Then what? I have no idea how. He can hear All Might's reply, pensive. I don't think I will ever be able to understand how his quirk truly works, or the way he perceives the world around him. But yesterday he managed to channel one last flame, a one for all back in me. Without his help, I'm not sure I could have defeated all for one. They are talking about him. Izuku hesitates at the door, blushing a bit. He knows that eavesdropping is not exactly nice, but after hearing that, he doesn't think he can just barge in. Would feel like waltzing in the spotlight voluntarily. How even? Grand Torino's eyes. An all for one knew him? From what young Bedoria has been able to tell me, he stumbled into him while he inappropriately used his quirk searching for young Bogogo. Apparently, all for one had much to say to him. A sigh. I'm glad he seems to have understood and decided to stop using his quirk in that way. The mere idea he had to spend even just a minute listening to that man sends a shiver down my spine. For the love of Gran Torino replies, tired. Are we sure he's not your actual son? I'm pretty sure, sir. Izuku hears mom reply, not without a trace of amusement in her voice. I'm sorry Izuku has given you all so many troubles. Aizawa sensei sighs. You know what irks me the most about him? He starts, his voice that makes up irritation and tired acceptance. For every time he disobeys and does something he really should not, he manages to balance it out by doing something good and solving our problems. Makes it all the harder to scold him. Izuku drags a hand on his face, trying not to grin. All Might was right, he was probably causing Aizawa Sensei to go gray young. He really needed to get in there and apologize. Squaring himself with a deep breath, he knocks. Silence falls in the room, and then the door clicks open to Kuji's light standing in front of him. Well, here you are, he says, a smile in his voice. We were just talking about you. Oh, really? Izuku replies, the lie rolling a tad too easily on his tongue as he enters. He can feel eyes pointed at him as Tsukuuchi closes the door behind him. Um, good morning? It's almost two in the afternoon. Aizawa Sensei replies flat. Oh, explains why I'm so hungry. Izuku mutters to himself pensive. I, um... The silence stretches as he sighs, scratching the back of his head. Then he turns to face the little group of lights sitting around a table and formally bows to them. Everyone, I'm sorry. I know I did a lot of messed up things lately. He feels mom's tense light relax. I promise I will reflect on them and make sure I will not make the same mistakes, Izuku adds before slowly standing straighter. And, Aizawa Sensei, I know I gave you a lot of lack, especially, I'm really sorry. Aizawa Sensei sighs, tired. See, this is what I meant. He mutters, every time I want to get mad at him, he manages to get out of it. Izuku can't help but grin a little as the tense atmosphere in the room dissipates like clouds making way to a warm, joyous sun. 
They all left him in the conference room, producing from apparently out of nowhere three boxes of takeout that both Mom and All Might had unsightly pushed in front of him. Not that Izuku would complain, he was absolutely famished and he happily dug into one, leaving the adults to do their adult thing and probably talk some more about him away from his ears. At least his apologies seemed to have been acknowledged. Hopefully things would pick up from there. He hears the door open and then a huff as someone sits in front of him. Izuku blinks and keeps eating, his quirk turned off to avoid putting more strain on his already pretty heavy head. A doctor is going to check you up after you are done eating. As Allison says, so his voice flat. How are you feeling? Izuku shrugs. My back hurts and my head feels heavy, but all in all, not so bad. He admits, licking some curry away from his lips. I mean, I don't think I've been able to sleep without getting woken by nightmares for at least a month. But I did tonight, so it's not so bad. Aizawa says it hums and says nothing for a long while. Izuku finishes his rice. Sniffing the boxes, he decides to attack another that seems to contain some chicken. I think we've got a bit of miscommunication going, you and I. Aizawa sensei suddenly says, his voice still not giving anything away. I wanted to apologize for not being clear to you. Izuku almost chokes on a piece of chicken at that. It's strange and a bit unsettling having Sensei apologizing to him, especially considering how much Izuku has messed up lately. Oh, Sensei! There's no need, really! Aizawa Sensei sighs. I'm only human, and sometimes I make mistakes. Owning up to them is the least I can do. He says, Frank. I should have told you why I was so worried in the first place, instead of just putting a ban on this new ability of yours you've just discovered. Izuku bombs around, searching for the bottle of water he left there. When he can't seem to find it, Aizawa pushes it in his hands, silent. He takes a generous sip before talking. I, I understand. The headache, the bleeding, it's clear that putting so much strain on my quirk is dangerous. Do you still not remember what happened? Aizawa sensei asks softly. I muscular purposefully punched my back and I think I just sort of sent back the pain I felt. But I don't remember what happened after. It's just my memories all are scrambled and messy. I can't really make sense of them. When Aizawa sensei speaks again, there's a note of stifled anger in his voice and Izuku's heart falls to his feet for a second before he realizes that the anger is not directed at him. I can only take an educated guess. Aizawa sensei says, I can guess that the strength of that connection had been too much to handle, and you shut down acting on pure instincts. Sensei, what happened? Izuku asks, blinking, because it's clear that Aizawa sensei is holding more than he is letting on. Muscular. He... A long moment of hesitation. Another sigh. Part of his frontal lobe got destroyed. The chopsticks fell out of Izuku's hand as he bailed. What? It's not your fault, kid. Your brain is equipped to deal with that sort of stress, even if you suffered a backlash. His wasn't. You couldn't have known the possible side effects. Aizawa sends a continuous voice carefully low. It was a strenuous situation, and you were face to face with a man that wanted to kill you and Koda. Two children. I'm ready to bet that his aggressive intentions might have exerted an influence as well. Izuku slowly falls back against his seat, balls rabbiting in his temples. He feels a bit sick to his stomach, and I saw since he must have noticed because he can hear him standing and then sitting back down right by his side, putting a careful hand on his shoulder. We've got so used to them, we don't really think about it. But quirks are a dangerous thing. He says, slowly. The wrong kind of power in the wrong kind of hands. And that's how you get people like muscular. Like all for one. But you, you are nothing like them. You'd never purposefully and consciously inflict that kind of damage on someone, wouldn't you? No! Izuku chokes out after a beat of silence, feeling his eyes burn. Aizawa-sensei squeezes his shoulder. Kind. 
we will have time to talk about the possibilities of your quirk and the limits we must impose to it. But I trust that you've understood our concerns, and you will act accordingly. Izuku nods, speechless. Now finish your lunch. You need your strength, kiddo. He sadly obeys. Aizawa Sensei doesn't take that gentle contact between them away until he's done. The ride back home is a bit strained, understandably so. Izuku feels tired already, despite the fact he only woke a couple of hours prior. He feels like the fatigue he's been dragging around, ignored, finally got up to it, taking its place on his shoulders, especially after the serious chat he had with Aizawa Sensei and the long medical visit he went through after. His heart felt a bit heavy, but admittedly, the thought of going back home, not thinking about anything, just rest, as he had been ordered to do, was very inviting. His back felt sore and stiff. No surprises there. And Izuku just couldn't wait to take a shower and sink into his bed back into his room after what felt like ages and made me sleep for at least the entire day. But before that, there was mom and all the screwed up things he did in the last few days. What are you thinking about? He asks, careful and meek as the silence stretches. You tell me. She answers, her voice deliberately measured. Izuku flinches. I'm sorry, but you know that already. Aizai, I can't imagine how worried you must have been. I didn't take your feelings into consideration at all. Too wrapped up in my own issues, and that was... really uncool of me, to put it mildly. She doesn't answer for a long time before slowly saying... I should pull you out of school. Panic sparks in Emma, not forming in his throat immediately at the mere thought. If she did that, Izuku would never be able to see his friends again. He wouldn't be able to make Todoroki laugh again to speak with Ida about their favorite heroes to keep Uraraka company when she felt lonely. He doesn't say a word, biting down on his lower lip as his eyes sting. He knows his hands are trembling and he closes them into fists into his lap as he tries to rein in his panicked breathing. But you... You have taken this road, Mom says after what felt like an eternity. And you made it too far to turn back now. You will never stop, even if I beg you to, Izuku. That's not a question. Slowly, Izuku turns his face up to her, that familiar yearning for his eyes to work for once, filling his chest. Just, please, from now on, just think about all the people that care for you before taking any decisions, okay? He doesn't trust his voice, not the crack, so he nods, and then hears Mom sigh, resigned. He turns his face away before she can see the tears finally spilling from his eyes as his heart drums madly in his chest. He let his head fall on the backrest of the car seat, closing his eyes, taking a deep breath. <laughs> he hurt her so much. It's a miracle she's allowing him to still go to UA. This is the last chance you get, you utter dumbass. He says to himself harsh. Don't screw it up this time. You knew, you little shit! Miki's call came in the evening of his second day back home, waking him from the nap he was taking. Then again, that really couldn't be considered a nap. Hadn't it been for that call, he probably would have slept right through the night. Izuku answered it after the fifth ring. He honestly didn't want to, but, well... The jack was up, and he didn't have anywhere to run. So he stayed there, finally back home and relaxing on his bed, squaring himself as he took a deep breath. What do you think? He replied a bit sleepily. Bruh, Miki says, her voice suggested she still could not quite believe it. Talent scout my ass! You've been hanging out with All Might for months, and you knew! It was an accident, 
Izuku sighs weary, trying to twist the truth in ways that will allow him not to lie to his loved ones more than necessary. I just so happened to stumble into him and discover his secret. I think you can understand why I had to keep it to myself. Yeah, she says. I mean, me and mom almost had a heart attack when we saw him on TV, but yeah, I can understand. Thank you, Izuku replies, relieved. I didn't want to lie to you. Or to anyone else, for that matter. But it's not like I had much of a choice. It's strange to think back to those months before the start of high school, now that I know. He's kind of a huge dork, isn't he? Izuku Snickers. Yeah, he's pretty chill when he's not out there being the symbol of peace and stuff. His heart gave a little painful churn when the words made it out of his mouth. It still was a hard pill to swallow, the idea that All Might will never go out there being anything now. Miki must pick up on his silence, her voice gentle. This must be pretty awful for you, she says. I'm sorry he had to retire, but still he's going to keep teaching at UA, right? It's not like you've lasted forever. That is true, Izuko admits. All Might would still be at his side for as long. Well, for as long as possible. That still was hard to accept, too. But it's not like he had much of a choice in the matter. Izuku was going to make the most of their time together, that's for sure. I'm surprised you were only calling me now. I expected to find you waiting for me here, ready to give him the scolding of a lifetime. Izuku tentatively says into the silence. She scoffs. I wanted to, but you're lucky your mom asked me to give you a bit of time to rest, you shithead. Izuku says, I know, I've been a giant shithead, I'm sorry. She sniffs, not saying anything for a bit, before taking a little sigh. Like, I just... Be careful. For real, next time. I think I lost 10 years of my life in the last week only. I'm sorry. I'm not gonna say that everything is alright because that was not alright. But I trust that you've learned your lesson and won't try to long distance kill us again, hmm? Yeah, I promise that won't happen again. She says yet again, just answering with a tiny, okay. Move the silence falls on them once more. Say, Miki continues, her voice a bit more casual, interrupting the lull in the conversation. Why don't we organize a day out before the summer break is over? I think taking a day to relax would be good for all of us. I would like to see you and meet your other friends. Izuku blinks, shaken out of the little sleepy daze that took hold of him in the silence. My friends? Yeah, I already met a Jacko, but I still have to meet Ida and Todoroki too, right? I mean, I guess... A Jacko is all piece of you for a quite cute, but I think it's time I get to see them in the flesh, don't you? Right. Izuku admits unsure. Still, the idea of a day out seemed really nice, and he did want to see Miki as well. I'll ask them that. But you should bring your friends from school, too. And you're totally not my friend. Shut up, Izuku. She replies, making him laugh. Anyhow, next time you see Dad, mate, say hi from me. Izuku almost chokes on his own spit. Dad, mate! <laughs> Dad, like, come on. He acts as if he's your adopted dad. She replies, you two give that father some vibe all over the place, you know? Oh my god! Izuka whispers desperate as Mickey sneakers in his ear. Hey. Ashago looks at the text, indecisive. It had been a couple of days since the Kamino Ward incident, since All Might had been revealed to the world, since his real name made it out in the open. A name half of which she already knew. A couple of days of absolute silence. Everyone was taking their time to recover and reflect about it, just like she did, clearly. Everyone was ignoring the elephant in the room. That is, until she received that text from Todoroki. She had no idea a single hey could contain so many meanings. Hey, so what do you think? I think I don't have the slightest clue of what is going on anymore. I think we need to talk to him. Yes, that is also what I think. But I'm scared. I am too. If I have to be honest, I'm not sure if I really want to know the truth. Whatever that might be. She sighs, 
singing on the single battered armchair in the tiny kitchen of her apartment. I'm going to write in the group chat now. She tries to steal a resolve, opening the window that had remained stubbornly silent in the past two days. Hey guys, everything all right? I'm doing fine. I hope you are as well. Doing okay. The conversation lulled as it was clear that the three of them were waiting to hear from him. Her heart did a little somersault when the window announced that Midoriya was composing a message. It took them a while. Hey, so, well, I'm sure you all have a lot of questions, so I'm going to answer the most obvious ones. Yes, I knew he was All Might all along. No, I did not want to lie to you. But I think you will understand why I kept the secret to myself. And no, he's not my father. Why'd you all keep asking that, for the love of God? Well, that nickname sure stuck out like a sore thumb now. Still, the last part of the message made her snicker. Are you sure? Yes, Omaraka, I'm pretty sure I know if All Might was my father. I'm sorry I lied, but I'm also not sorry. It was a secret too big and too dangerous to blow off, even if I trust all of you with my own life. It's understandable. I think we would all have done the same in your shoes. There was another long pause. All of them afraid to ask, to say the first word, to even imply. Remember what I told you at the sports festival? How I could tell there was something between you and him. Yes. Well. Ochago feels as if that little small mite is writing at the bottom of the chat is making fun of her. It takes forever. It's complicated. Well, that's all that time for how long he has taken to reply. She wonders just how many times Midoriya had dictated a message yet only to delete it and start from scratch. But he was still writing. It's true that he's kind of a family friend at this point. I accidentally discovered his secret before high school and he was forced to explain to me and mom. He's kind, you know that, and he decided to take responsibility for my education, help training me to get me in UA. Before him, I never even dared to think about trying the exam. I was sure I could never be able to. But he's been there for me and I can't deny that he's more than just a teacher to me. I'm sorry if this doesn't make much sense, it's just all very emotional. And even if you are my best friends, I'm still scared of people knowing, you know? Oh, Jacko sighed. Of course he was scared. She would be too had she been in his shoes. And, well, in retrospect, considering what she had seen. What they all had seen, it was clear that All Might had a special relationship with him. She smiles a little sadly looking out at the phone before an idea to light up the atmosphere a bit strikes her. So, basically... He's not your dad, but he's kind of your dad. Oh my god! <sighs> okay, I actually laughed. That one was good. Same. I hate all of you! <laughs> anyway, off topic, but before the summer break is over, we should organize a day out or Mickey will skin me alive. She really wants to meet all of you. I thought you hated us! Oh, Rebecca, please! Ajago still had many questions, as she's sure they all did. But she also felt that maybe some secrets are better left untouched. That didn't answer much, but I think I'm just going to take it, to be honest. She looks at the message Todoroki sent her in private, echoing her current feeling. Same! I just feel like it's better not to poke this sleeping dog. Yeah, besides, if there's more to that, I'm sure he will tell us when he's ready. Well, I guess I'll see you soon, Araka. Take care.